topics that we're missing, uh, please feel free to send them in. Uh, we'd love to be able to keep giving voice to all the all the good things that are happening in, in and around um, in and around Rosebud. I know one thing just off the top of my head. Big shout out to RST Childcare. I believe um, pulled in a massive, awesome project from. ANA super competitive uh, grant that's going to be doing a lot of like um, cultural activities, language learning and immersion and, and um, with, with, with the young kids. So awesome job. Congrats to, to that program and super excited to see uh, what kind of things pop up here in, in the next, next uh, couple of months as that gets going. Um, but yeah, if you have other, other events, other news, other things we, we can share and highlight that's positive local work, please send them in. We'd be happy to, happy to share. Awesome. Lots of good information. We got great things going on here locally. Um, even through the pandemic, man, everybody's been staying busy, working from home, making things happen. Uh, my friends and I are definitely going to do the Tatanka Trot. I already tagged them on Facebook and everybody said they're down. So I'm excited for that. That's happening um, next week. But for today's show, I'm really excited about this. And we need to talk about this because it's such crucial times right now in the second wave of the pandemic. So for today's episode, we got uh, Linda Black Elk, who we'll go ahead and introduce here in just a little bit. Uh, Linda is from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and she's just very active in promoting uh, tribal food sovereignty and health and wellness through the use of native plants. So let's go ahead and bring Linda on so we can start this awesome discussion. Hello, Linda. Hi there, how are you guys? Oh, Good, we're doing great. how about you? Man, even I'm better really now good. that you're here. Good to see you. I just have to make a quick correction um, before I start getting emails. I'm not enrolled on Standing Rock. I just have lived there. Michael knows this <laughs> for a very long time. <laughs> and, and among there, and my, uh, my two oldest kids are enrolled on Standing Rock. So yeah, okay. but yeah, so happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for say, clearing I, that I up. I'm glad you did. Put Linda in hot water. <laughs> See, people, okay. people be on her Facebook trolling her, getting all crazy with it. Thank you for correcting uh, my, like, um, you know, like, I, I, I feel so lucky and blessed because a long time ago, I came to Standing Rock and, um, you know, I uh, married someone from Standing Rock and, like, they found a place for me. Like, they didn't need me and God knows they didn't want me. <laughs> but they, you know, they found a place for me um, in their community and they are still my friends and my family and I love them so much. So, so no, like I, you know, I think that they'd probably laugh about that too, but. <laughs> so now totally. that we know for oh. sure that you're not an enrolled uh, member, how about you just go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself and what all you're involved in. Awesome. Sorry, starting a watch party here um, on my cell phone. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, I do the same thing. <laughs> so I'm, uh, hey honey, come here just for one sec. So I, uh, I'm Linda Black Elk. I am the Food Sovereignty Skills Coordinator at United Tribes Technical College. This is my husband, just real quick, having him peek in. This is Luke Black Elk. <laughs> He's um, Itazipcho from Cheyenne River, and then also Oglala uh, from down on Pine Ridge. Um, I am a mixture of things. My mom is Asian. She's half Korean and half Mongolian, an indigenous woman from Mongolia. And then my dad is, of course, European, um, but also we are descendants of a few Eastern tribes, including the Catawba. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I have three kids, three sons, um, no daughters, but I ain't gonna try again because then I'll have four sons and I <laughs> can't, can't handle that. Um, and they're uh, 18, 16, and 5, and um, yeah, they're all my band of Lakotas that I, I always say, um, well, people always tease my husband that they sent him out to get horses, and he brought me back, so. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm super happy to be here and talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Um, really honored, and um, I, it's like my work at United Tribes focuses on ethnobotany, so teaching how to use plants for food and medicine, and then also on food sovereignty. And I'm really lucky because um, United Tribes 
you know, I, I've worked at tribal colleges for a long time and I love and miss my family at Sitting Bull College. But one thing I really love about United Tribes is that they have put food sovereignty really at the forefront of their entire um, system, you know, uh, of, you know, they're trying to make sure that their students, all students have access to good, uh, high quality traditional foods. And, um, you know, they even, if, if the pandemic weren't going on, we were even going to butcher a buffalo, you know, as, um, as a team, all of us at the college and uh, things like that. So instead, we ended up having someone else butcher it for us. But our students still um, have access to a lot of really good foods. And um, I'm also, of course, handing out medicine to COVID positive folks and making food kits for elders. We've been doing that since March. And um, of course, I can talk more about that. Um, oh, and we've made some deliveries down on Rosebud, actually, too, uh, to elders and to other folks in need down there. Um, that's been really fun. And um, I don't know when the next time we'll be getting down to Rosebud might be, but I love it and miss it down there and all of you guys and love passing by the, the gardens and stuff and your cool dome. <laughs> uh, yeah, Liz, this is, I'm already looking at the time and like an hour is never enough with Linda. But, um, so many good things to talk about. Um, you mentioned ethnobotany. You mentioned your, you know, your work at tribes as a as a professor, gardener, you know, wild harvester, water protector, indigenous mom, you know, political activist on Facebook. Like hell yeah, I love all the things you got going on. Are are super cool. One one of the things I kind of wanted to keep keep going on just for a second here is um, that gets me really excited about what tribes is doing in terms of centering food sovereignty and thinking about uh, institution, you know, higher ed education you know, focusing on things that are of concerns to the community, of to indigenous communities. Can you talk a little bit more about that and why that's so, why you see that's so important and necessary? Sure. So, you know, it's interesting when I first, uh, like when the pandemic, when we first started hearing rumblings, you know, um, my uh, supervisor, Brian McGinnis, he's a really awesome guy and he, he was an um, organic farmer for a really long time. And we were all just talking, uh, the whole team at, uh, within the land grant programs was talking about how a pandemic might impact indigenous communities. And the first thing we thought of was food shortages. Um, and, and, and beyond that, we started talking about the fact, and, and you've heard me talk about this over and over, but it's so important to really keep reiterating the reason the pandemic is impacting indigenous people so um, strongly. The reason why Native Americans are four times more likely to have complications from COVID uh, than, than other populations is because of our colonized diet, because, because of the food that we've been forced to eat for generations now. And so that food has put us at high risk for things like diabetes, heart disease, and asthma. And then what are the greatest risk factors for complications and even death from COVID-19? Diabetes, heart disease, and asthma, right? So it's this, it's this vicious cycle that's been brought on by really, um, you know, uh, a not a great diet. And of course, a health system, a healthcare system that's really lacking. But to me, it, it really all goes back to food and, and what we're putting in our bodies. And that includes medicine too, but as we know, food is medicine. So, um, you know, we, we were talking at United Tribes about what should happen. And, you know, for a long time, we've been doing research. The people at United Tribes have been doing research on food, research on gardens, research on three sisters, you know, research on nutrition. And this, this year we said, you know what? we have to focus on growing food. We really need to focus, and that's what we have done. Um, right in the spring, we just started planting stuff, and you know we've been doing these amazing harvests since the early spring, and actually giving good, fresh fruits and vegetables out every single week to um, as many people who wanted them in our local area. And, and that just, that didn't um, 
you know, we didn't exclude people out off campus either, you know, community members could even come and get good food. And then that was fresh food. And I have been concentrating with the support of United Tribes. Um, my family and I have been concentrating on making food kits. And um, those food kits contain shelf stable foods. So dried stuff, right? Um, so dried meat, dried corn, wild rice, um, I always forget, oh, maple syrup, maple sugar, you know, because we really wanted to try to get people away from refined sugar and refined flour. Um, so, you know, we've been putting a lot of, um, it's, it's been traditional foods, traditional foods, beans, you know, amazing beans, beautiful, um, beautiful stuff and all organic. So we have been putting uh, bags of organic white flour into our kits. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and, and, you know, but, but we make sure that everything, no matter what it is, is organic and um, sustainably sourced. And as much of it as possible, it has been sourced from uh, indigenous people. So we've been like sourcing from indigenous producers from the beginning. We actually had two ind indigenous producers come to us and say, your food kits are what kept us afloat this year. And that made me feel so good um, because, you know, we like, obviously we don't have the money <laughs> in just me and my husband to be um, purchasing all of this stuff. We have been um, getting donations and raising um, money from individuals individuals who have just put in five or ten dollars when they can um, but you know just really super caring people from everywhere um, and the reason why okay let me say the reason why we've been putting things like a bag of white flour in there and a bag of oil or a bottle of oil um, even though at first we were like no we're not you know fight the map power we're not going to put that stuff in there you know um but it, it comes down to the fact that like i used to be super mean and even militant about fry bread no one get mad at me okay um <laughs> i used to be really mean about it and and i used to be like fry bread is the food of the oppressor eliminate fry bread you know and like people were like Oh my God, you know, especially my Diné friends. We all know how Diné are with their fry bread, right? And they would get so mad at me. And they, you know, because they have such heartfelt memories of like making fry bread with their grandmothers and like learning her recipe and perfecting it. And, um, <laughs> sorry. And, um, you know, so of course they were super offended by that. And they should be because fry bread really is a survival food. And that got, indigenous people through some of the most difficult times in our history, right? And so um, I was neglecting to uh, think about that and think about those heartfelt memories around fry bread. Um, in my old age, <laughs> I have become a lot more gentle, I hope. And instead, I've said to myself, you know what, instead of like constantly talking about eliminating things from our diet, I need to instead talk, talk, uh, talk about how we can add amazing things to our diet, right? So if people want fry bread, okay, um, have you ever thought about using half acorn flour in your fry bread or a quarter acorn flour? Or have you ever tried using um, uh, 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 um, almond flour? Or have you ever tried, you know, um, instead of making fry bread, make some gabubu bread? And, you know, because of course, deep frying things is a big part of the problem. Um, you know, things like that are, uh, uh, you know, just talking about how we can add things. Instead of using sweet corn, yellow sweet corn all the time, which is super high on the glycemic index, you know, um, and super full of, of simple sugars. Did I, did I pause? You, you froze, but we could still hear you. So you, okay. <laughs> you have a great frozen posture, but the, there you go, you're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. You guys froze and I realized, oh no, I think I froze. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've just been, instead of using yellow sweet corn, try different varieties of Indian corn, like what you guys have been growing. I hope you can still hear me. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, things like that. And, and just talking about exchanges and things like that and trying to be more gentle um, and trying, you know, really hard. Uh, one of the things that I think has been happening a lot is food shaming 
and it's, it's um, you know, making people feel bad for their food choices. And that's not at all what we need to be doing. We need to be talking about giving instead, you know, making people really proud of their traditional foods instead of shaming them for the food choices they make. Hey, if people have a box of ramen noodles, I totally get it. I mean, I'm half Asian. I eat ramen, you guys. <laughs> you know? I mean, but, but you know, um, have you ever tried putting a lot of vegetables in there and some really thinly sliced lean meat? Thinly sliced bison in, in ramen noodles is delicious. Um, and, you know, some vegetables and maybe an egg in there, things like that. So, um, you know, there, there are really ways, even, you know, talking to college students, I talk to them about, oh, you love pizza? Load that sucker up with vegetables and make it thin crust so that um, you're getting less of those simple carbohydrates from the crust, you know? Um, there are simple things we can do to help each other. Um, I don't know, did you guys see the food boxes the U.S. government handed out to people the other day? That farmer something program? I did it. Like, led by Ivanka Trump. Oh my God. I wish I could post this picture for you guys. There were, um, was it 16, a total of 56 hot dogs in those food packs. No lie. It was like hot dogs was the only meat source, by the way. Um, cottage cheese. Um, it had a, a carton of eggs. It, it did have strawberries in there. One, uh, one lady posted a picture and, and she said there were grapes in here, but I had to throw them away because they were rotten. Um, and there were, I don't think that there was a vegetable in there at all, but, but the only source, it was like eight packs of hot dogs, you know? Um, and, and I was like, you know what? This is why these food kits and this is why feeding each other and talking about traditional foods and medicines is so important because that stuff is just insane, you know? <laughs> but yeah, so, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, United Tribes has been really helping like with the food kits and, um, you know, supporting me in, in those distributions. We've been growing food. It, it's crazy because here we are getting toward mid to the end of November. And I, I don't know what you guys still have growing, but in the United Tribes gardens, we still have gorgeous spinach coming up. We still have kale that people can harvest. We still have collard greens that people can get. And I, you know, I think people believe like this is North Dakota, you know, right now everything's dead, you know, and uh, you, there's nothing that you can eat, but, but there's still tons of stuff, even wild foods that you can go out and get right now. Rose hips, you know, the berries off of the rose bush, crazy high in vitamin C, a wonderful tea to fight COVID because uh, they help to boost the immune system and fight infection. Um, you know, yeah, there's just still so much that we can be doing right now, even though it's cold and snowy. So Linda, you had mentioned right at the beginning that food is medicine. And I know I read an article by you. I'm trying to see if I can find it. You'll have to remind us of what it was, but you had mentioned that um, if we're eating the food that our ancestors are, were eating, will be less prone to mental, emotional, and physical illness. So can you elaborate just a little bit more on that? Sure, of course. So um, here, here's a crazy thing that a lot of people, even a lot of people who take medication for depression, don't realize how connected depression and anxiety are to our diet. Um, highly inflammatory foods, things that um, cause a lot of inflammation, uh, actually can cause depression as well. Inflammation is very connected to depression. So if you know someone who maybe has a lot of sore joints or they wake up and they're like, oh my God, or oh my back, right? Um, and you know, if, if they are also someone who experiences a lot of depression, oftentimes the physical manifestation um, is, is, is caused by inflammation, uh, uh, that mental, uh, those mental uh, issues, the depression caused by inflammation, which is caused by uh, eating a lot of inflammatory foods. So um, I guess when I, when I say those things, what I really like to think about and what I really encourage people to think about is the fact that food doesn't just provide calories for us, or it shouldn't, right? You can get calories from a Twinkie. You can, right? You can, you can probably, if you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere, if I was stuck out in the middle of nowhere and I found a Twinkie on the ground, you know, it could be 20 years old and that shit, oops, 
sorry, that stuff would still be edible. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. I was trying to talk all ghetto there. And I, God. So, so, you know, you could find a super old Twinkie. I would eat it because it would be calories for survival, right? But it's not, um, it's not food that is also feeding us spiritually and mentally and emotionally, right? Um, so those foods, in fact, you know, I, I really feel like foods that are high in sugar and foods that are high in salt and high in food colorings, it's almost like they, they rob us of uh, spirit and rob us of um, being able to experience and feel emotions. And there's actually a lot of um, a scientific basis for that assertion as well. Um, you know, food, if we're eating the foods that that we're supposed to be eating, if we're eating the foods of our ancestors, no matter who they are, whether you are of European descent or whether you're indigenous to here or like my mom, indigenous to places in Asia, if you're eating the foods of your ancestors, you know, before all of this processed foods, before all the high sugar and high salt stuff, you are going, you're, you're not going to um, experience as much mental, physical, uh, emotional, and spiritual illness. So it's, it's just so important and and you know then you're not going to be at high risk either for all of these crazy uh diseases that are going around and and so like another thing that i really like to impress upon is i i believe so i'm 46 and i believe that this is not the last pandemic virus i'm going to see in my lifetime it, just like we're seeing a lot more extreme climate issues Right, we're seeing a lot more tornadoes, a lot more extreme um, rainstorms, a lot more hurricanes, things like that because of climate change. We are also going to start seeing a lot more extreme illnesses, um, new viruses that pop up because of um, uh, all kinds of issues, you know, because of climate change, but also because, you know, like we're, we're drilling in places uh, and uncovering viruses that people thought were extinct for a very long time. Um, you know, all of those things are being unearthed and it's gonna cause a lot more problems as time goes on. So it's more important than ever for us to return to uh, as traditional a diet as possible, as sovereign a diet as possible, um, growing our own food, foraging our own food, hunting, fishing, things like that. I love it, I love it. I, I think that it's very telling that we talk, we're talking a lot about, um, medicines and, and, and people immediately go to, to medicines, but then so much of the conversation is around food, right? Yes. Food and, and obviously water as first medicines and things that are going to keep people healthy and keep people safe. But this whole conversation brings me back to probably the first time I actually got to meet you in person was at a local foods conference in um, Deadwood. And the presentation you gave was how to survive the zombie apocalypse. And now I'm literally <laughs> like, ah, Okay, now zombies, here we are. We're there. <laughs> yeah, we're here, here we are. So, <laughs> yes. And talk and about the, that a little bit. Well, the crazy yeah. thing about that is is like what foods are we turning to or what medicines and foods are we turning to now? We're turning to a lot of those in that list. It was 10 plants to survive the zombie apocalypse and, you know, elderberry, <laughs> rose hips, um uh I I I'm just trying to remember. I could probably pull it up for us if, if we wanted, but we don't have time. Nettles uh, is another one. Uh, so nettles are super anti-inflammatory. Oh, so COVID, like talking, talking about COVID a little bit. Um, I was talking to my Mashke Tpziwi Tolman. Um, she has been making medicines and sending them out to people, beautiful medicines. My Mashke Florice White Bull, she's been doing the same. And, um, you know, uh, Sashin Whitetail has been helping us. And um, then, you know, we have Skybird Black Owl and Natalie Stites Means in Rapid City and, you know, Lisa Iron Cloud and all of these people getting together to make all these beautiful medicines. Deanna Eagle Feather right there on Rosebud, amazing with plants um, and um, another Mashke of mine. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about all this, all of us have been getting together and we've all been reading the literature too, right? You know, we, we're all um, really intelligent people who love to be well-informed and we have really seen that, um, and, and now of course, the, the literature and the, the science is backing us up, <laughs> you know, uh, but 
it's inflammation. You know, I was talking about inflammation a second ago, second ago, COVID is all about inflammation. It causes the epithelial lining of blood vessels to expand or inflame and then uh, causes damage to that epithelial lining. Um, it causes inflammation in the joints, in the lungs, in the liver, in the kidneys, um, even in the heart, you know, fluid buildup even. And it's just, you know, really, really, um, it, it actually sounds a lot like various stages of heart disease even. And so we've been focusing a lot on anti-inflammatories. So things like nettles, stinging nettles, you know, things like dandelion root, burdock root, um, uh, the mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms uh, like chaga and um, uh, reishi and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, a lot like elderberry, another beautiful anti-inflammatory, rose hips, um, uh, you know, as I was talking about nettles, I use nettles even for allergies and uh, they're one of my favorite medicines. But, you know, uh, the talking about like 10 plants to survive the zombie apocalypse, it's like, wow, you know, when I made that, I had no idea we were that close to having our own sort of apocalypse again. Um, and I say again, because indigenous people have experienced that before. Um, but, you know, those medicines are really the ones we're turning to now. And those foods uh, like teepsila and, um, you know, buffalo berries and choke cherries, that's what the foods we're turning to. Those are all like choke cherries are amazing for the lungs. So, you know, if you guys have your um, choke cherry patties all saved up, if you have some frozen choke cherries, start thinking about making wojapi out of those and um, uh, having, you know, a quarter cup of wojapi every day. Uh, uh, that would be fantastic lung support um, for people who haven't even gotten COVID yet. It would help to strengthen the lungs. Give that to your elders, you know.